I don't know what it is about media produced in the 1980s that makes it so mysterious, so grungy, so worn, and so awesome. Whether it's the smoky neon haze of 1982's Blade Runner, the brutality of the Predator, or the worn out, lived in universe of The Empire Strikes Back, 80s science fiction has a certain feel to it. It's a little more dark than the sci-fi of the 90s, less flamboyant and fantastical than its predecessors from the 50s and 60s. 80s sci-fi in particular makes me want to smoke a cigarette in a dark basement, watching an old anime on a CRT TV monitor. It just has a feel to it, you know? And while all the examples I just gave are ones created in the West, the East also got its taste of darkened edge in the 80s. Yes, anime got a little darker in this particular decade, with titles like Akira and Fist of the North Star being incredibly popular pieces of media from that time period. Oi, Chief among these titles is a show named Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. Now, I went over the process of Gundam's popularity in my first video. If you haven't watched it, go check it out. But to sum it up, Gundam came out, and it was good, but not especially popular, so it was sort of obscure after ending its on-air run. However, Bandai absolutely made bank on Gundam toys and model kits, and Mobile Suit Gundam became posthumously popular thanks to toy sales and reruns. Now, Sunrise is a smart, huge, greedy company, and after seeing the fat stack of cash that the original Mobile Suit Gundam was able to eventually rake in, they told Tomino, father of the series, to run wild. Go ahead, here, have the budget, have 50 episodes like you originally wanted for the first show, have it all! Just make sure you make a ton of mechs that can be sold as toys, or else. And so, bursting from the ashes like some sort of mechanical phoenix, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam was born. Tomino returned as director of the new series, and according to the man himself, Zeta Gundam was created in a time when he used animation and storytelling as a medium for expressing his frustrations. The result is a show that's much darker than the original, with more of a focus on political intrigue and the lengths that men will go to retain power. Don't worry now, there's plenty of mecha action to go around. In fact, the amount of battles and new suit variants eclipses the original. Seriously, besides the titular mobile suit, one thing that Zeta snipes heavily from the original MSG is its Battle of the Week, More Toys Now attitude. And hey, Bandai is a company, obviously, and they gotta get that sweet Gumpla cash, so it's alright. Because the result is one of the darkest, grittiest, and most intriguing pieces of anime this side of grips. That's a lot, by the way. What in the name of Turn A Gundam is a grips, you might say? Well, it just so happens to be a literal military-industrial complex, and the focal point of the conflict for Zeta Gundam. Officially referred to as the Grips War, or Grips Conflict, in the Universal Century timeline, the central conflict for Zeta Gundam is an internal power struggle from within the Federation, that eventually will explode into a second full-blown war with Zeon. Now, the original MSG introduced a lot of factions, characters, and locations, 
And Zeta keeps up with that trend by, well, introducing more factions, characters, and locations. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's establish the main players. First, we're introduced to the Titans. Earth Federation bad boys with black and red uniforms and a penchant for just kind of beating the shit out of anyone that disagrees with them? I don't know what the fuck just happened, but I don't really care. I'm gonna get the fuck up out of here. This shit, I'm out. On the other side, we have the Anti Earth Union Group, or the AUG for short, another group within the Federation that opposes the Titans' methods. After the end of the One Year War, as depicted in the original Gundam, the Titans were formed as a special military wing with only one objective hunt down Zeon Remnant. Eight years after the climactic battle of Ao Boaku, the Titans have gained so much influence within the Federation that they make up a large portion of its military and are scheming to achieve a full takeover. The Aeug, on the other hand, oppose the Titans both politically and militarily, while also having the goal of convincing the Federation as a whole to stop polluting the Earth and let her heal. Portrayed as an alliance of different colonies and anti-Titan resistance groups, the Aeug and its state-of-the-art warship, the Argama, looks really familiar, has sent a covert operative in a red mobile suit named Sh uh, Quattro Bagina to spy on a Titan military facility. Thus opens the first episode of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. And no, I'm not going to go into exhaustive detail like last time. However, we will be discussing a few different story points and beats that happen throughout the show, so general spoiler warning on the rest of this video. If you want to watch Zeta Gundam completely blind, stop here. So, while fancy lad Quattro is flying around taking pictures with his fancy space Polaroid camera, we meet our true main character. No, it's not Amuro. We get introduced to blue-haired Amuro. Jokes aside, Camille is the true protagonist of Zeta Gundam, and while I do like Amuro as an MC, and I enjoyed his arc in the original show, I find Camille to be much more compelling of a character. When we first meet Camille, he's abrupt, edgy, immature, and aggressive. Amuro was the kind of guy that would give you a snide remark and then sulk in his room. Camille's the kind of guy that would just slug you in the face. At least at first. Of course, our boy in blue goes through the full arc where he experiences the horrors of war, finds love, loses it a bunch of times. But at the start of Zeta, we get to enjoy immature Camille. And while some people find his short-sighted aggressive temperament annoying as a main character, I can't help but love him. Maybe it's because I watched Zeta directly after the original show, so I was directly comparing Camille to Amuro, or... Maybe I find it hard to hate a guy who steals a Gundam and threatens to stomp a cop for being rude? Who knows? <laughs> anyway, we first meet Camille and he runs away from school. Just cause, I guess. He lives on the colony of Green Noah One, a military-run training, education, and government facility. Many of its inhabitants are employed by the Titans and work on its sister colony, Green Noah Two. Yes, it does get a little confusing, but they renamed Green Noah 2 to Grips anyway, so it doesn't really matter. All you need to know starting out is that Camille comes from a colony controlled by the Titans, and his parents are military engineers working for the Gundam Mark II program. We also get introduced to a Titan pilot and career idiot, Jared Mesa, and believe me when I tell you that being a moron is his entire job in this show, I don't think he achieves any objective throughout all of Zeta, but he still gets promoted, usually while his female subordinates get destroyed under his command. He really is the best example of failing upwards and the glass ceiling of the Titan command structure. 
As we'll see later in the series, Zeta has a lot to say about women and the relationships that the main characters have with them. I think the really funny thing is the entire show would have never happened if it wasn't for Jared being a complete tool bag. After skipping school one day, Camille runs into Jared, who having heard his feminine name goes full Pepe Le Pew mode, he's basically like, girl, wear a girl. I mean, Jared, that's weird, dude. You're weird. Camille, being the angsty teen that he is, just attacks him immediately, causing him to get thrown into a holding cell, which he then gets out of after his mommy pulls some strings. Remember, both parents are fairly important Titan engineers, and Camille has a strange relationship with them. Being a Gundam protagonist, we cannot have a happy family. A Titan officer then taunts Camille, causing him to fight them again after he was just released from custody for doing the exact same thing. And he only escapes because idiot Supreme Jared crashes a fucking top secret Gundam into the building. Camille runs away, loops back, and steals the Gundam. Side note, the amount of times a mobile suit is stolen or launches without permission in the show is staggering. They really need to get better security on these things. From here, there isn't much for Camille to do, but very reluctantly join forces with the AU, since there's no going back from, you know, attempted murder and all that. While all this is happening, a parallel story is happening on Green Noah 2's sister colony, which I'm just going to refer to as Grips from now on to avoid confusion. Quattro Bajina, totally not Char, I mean, look at him, how could he be? Infiltrates Grips and captures some key information about the Gundam Mark II project and decides to steal one of the suits for the AU. His team of Rick Dias mobile suits engages the Titan GMs outside the colony, and these two parallel stories culminate in Camille and Quattro working together to capture the experimental mobile suit. For the AU, this is a key development in their tensions with the Titans. In fact, stealing the Gundam is the official start of the Grips War, throwing the Titans and AU into full-on armed conflict. Okay, so now we have our groundwork for the major conflict of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. I will not go into as much detail as I did with the original Gundam video. That was way too exhaustive and probably too much work. Thanks for the advice, Gundam subreddit. I do, however, want to point out that the Titans are illustrated as absolutely evil in comparison to the Ayug by killing both of Camille's parents. They literally put Camille's mom in a little glass space bubble and then shoot her with a mobile suit. It's, it's crazy and evil. Also, Jared is the one who kills Camille's mom, even if he technically didn't know she's there. That won't be the first woman he gets killed, let me tell you. The rest of the show deals with some pretty heavy stuff as well. We get full-scale war, gassing entire civilian colonies, blowing up colonies with a big laser. Zeon comes back, people get betrayed, the government experiments on vulnerable young women in order to turn them into new types, but in the process destroys their cognitive functions with psychic torture. You know, the stuff every good government gets up to. The show also has just about the darkest ending possible. I, I won't ruin anything, but wow. No one's happily running on a beach here. This ain't Yu Yu Hakusho. This is Gundam, damn it. One aspect of Zeta Gundam that I find very interesting is its use of an extensive female cast. Anime, especially action sci-fi anime of the 80s, is very manly in that it usually consists of big men being bigger than other big men and waving those big dicks, I mean biceps, around. Sure, there are strong women in a lot of shows too, but Zeta kind of blows those out of the water. Of the 21 named mobile suit pilots that have a significant presence in Zeta, nine of them are women. And most of those nine are actual important characters with development and important parts to play, where some of the men in that group only show up once or twice. As a whole, the female pilots in the show are presented as capable, reliable, competent characters that are well written and have a huge impact. Not only on the plot as a whole, but on our main character Camille. Zeta Gundam and Gundam as a whole can also be used as a soapbox for social issues of the 80s. For example, Jared Mesa constantly fucks up, getting his subordinates and squadmates killed multiple times. 
but he gets promoted and let off the hook nearly constantly. In fact, the only times he ever gets punished is whenever Camille gives him a spanking and sends him back to his room. I find it interesting that in a show with a large female cast, the one who gets promoted is an idiot who gets a few of them killed. And it seems to be because, well, he's got a little dingle dangler down there and he's kinda charismatic. That's a real world issue that's very well illustrated in Zeta Gundam. The glass ceiling sure is thick when you have a dumbass Jared calling the shots for you. And if that isn't enough to convince you that Zeta Gundam was trying to shine a light on society's gender imbalances, how about the fact that Paptimus Sirocco, the main antagonist of the entire show, gets to where he is by being a weirdo groomer from Jupiter? Yeah, this guy embodies manipulation with a capital M. He's constantly surrounding himself with younger women that are totally subservient to him through manipulation, and if he can't manipulate them, he just tries to kill them, like he does with Haman Karn. Or he just experiments on them to make cyber new types, including wiping their memories and almost destroying their brain. Speaking of Haman Karn, the new leader of Axis Xeon, certified badass and space freak that she is, there's another powerful female character for you. She doesn't take any shit from anyone, commands loyalty through skill and political maneuvering, and she makes Char grumble a whole ton. Overall, she isn't in the show a whole lot, I mean she doesn't even get introduced until about halfway through the series, but she's cool and her mobile suit looks like a big moth, so that's extra points right there. We have Fa Yuri, who initially reminds me of Frau Bo from the original show. She starts out as Camille's childhood friend and love interest while taking care of the children on board the Argama. Where Fa comes into her own is by piloting the transforming mobile suit Methus. Fa actually participates in more battles than I initially thought, and her arc is fairly simple and grounded throughout the show. She never becomes an ace pilot with the likes of Camille or Char, but she's there as support. Initially I just thought she would be a love interest for Camille, but I was wrong. Emma Sheen is a mobile suit pilot originally working for the Titans before deserting and joining the Ayug. Emma is actually one of my favorite characters in Zeta. She leaves the Titans of her own will after recognizing how terrible they are. She's a very respectable pilot, flying the Gundam Mark II after Camille upgrades to the Zeta Gundam. And Emma is probably the most grounded and pragmatic character. Being a career soldier, she has good battle sense and uses tactics to her advantage. Her input is recognized and appreciated by all the other characters, including Bright and Char. Overall, she's kind of the backbone of the Argama crew. She does work, essentially. Finally, in this list of main characters is Rekoa Lond. Rekoa is a complicated character, and one whose arc is impacted by the translation of Zeta Gundam, unfortunately. General sentiment online usually presents Rekoa in a negative light, saying she threw away her morals among other things. Personally, I'm not so sure. She was part of a resistance group during the events of the One Year War fighting against Xeon. After that, she became an undercover operative for the Ayug and eventually makes her way on board the Argama, becoming one of its main mobile suit pilots, at least for a while. While at first portrayed as a competent and professional soldier focused on furthering the Ayug's agenda, eventually she takes a liking to Char and after being spurned by him, she betrays the Ayug and joins the Titans. Whoa, whoa, she switches sides to the bad guys cause Char won't date her? I mean, he's hot, but come on. Well, not really. It appears as though Sirocco gives her the attention that she wants causing her to shift allegiances, but in reality, Rekoa has a very tragic past that helps explain her actions. This is really only brought up in her final scene, and it's translated in a weird fashion, so I don't blame people for not recognizing it. In fact, it whooshed right past me until I started writing this script. Sometime into the show, Rekoa starts to shift from her professional soldier attitude, and she starts talking about womanly needs, and her feelings as a woman. She packs everything in her quarters away, not wanting to feel any sort of attachment. It all culminates at the end of the show, during a battle between Rekoa and Emma. 
Rekawa's final moments allow her to expose her views that men will only ever use women as tools for war or otherwise. This is illustrated as true by the actions of Sirocco. But she also says that Emma can't understand her shame and that men humiliated her. At first glance, it seems like she's referring to her career or her love life. But what Rekawa is really getting at is some time in her past, probably while fighting in the One Year War, she was sexually assaulted. In Japanese, the word Hazuka Shimaru carries the meaning of being shamed or humiliated. It is also a euphemism in Japanese for being raped. So, yeah, while this one is semi lost in translation to English, after discovering the meaning behind her last words, I thought of Rekawa in a much different light than before. Her arc doesn't have a clean ending, she doesn't get what she wants, she doesn't come back over to the side of the good guys and save them before it's too late. It's not an especially cinematic character arc, but it feels very real. And if there's one thing that Gundam is great at besides selling toys, it's writing characters that feel like real people. Well, I said at the beginning that this show was quite a bit more dark, didn't I? It's not just in storytelling, either. The color palette takes on somber shades of grays, blacks, and reds. The soundtrack is littered with ominous themes that make you want to sit in a musty, smoke-filled room and brood. This is the perfect show to advertise why film grain filters can be used to great effect to establish mood. In general, the art style in Zeta is so much more detailed than the original Mobile Suit Gundam. The mechs themselves are less blocky, the colors are also more muted and realistic. Even the Gundam itself has taken on a darker color scheme. At the start of the series, the Gundam Mark II is actually painted black, and I personally think this is the coolest looking Gundam of them all. Say what you want about the Titans, but their model painting is definitely on point. The one thing I noticed while watching Zeta is the mechs also feel more grounded in design. The Rick Dias is a new design, and in my opinion, it's one of the greatest in the whole franchise. I just love it. Everything on the Rick Dias seems to have an actual purpose. It looks like how a real mech suit might actually look. I also love that it inherits the single eye motif from the Zaku 2s in Mobile Suit Gundam. In fact, that's another thing that makes the world feel so realistic and lived in. The Rick Dias is made by Anaheim Electronics, the same in-universe company that created the Zaku. It's attention to detail like this that really sets the world of Gundam apart. The original Mobile Suit Gundam is a fun show, with a deep and worthwhile story, but it looks old. Honestly, I understand why the animation and art style of the original show can be a huge barrier of entry for people that want to experience the franchise from the very beginning. MSG had heart, but the animation was scrappy, to put it lightly. Zeta, on the other hand, is a show that holds up even today at certain points. By 1986, anime had really found its footing as far as animation and style were concerned. Zeta's dark, moody, grungy, and a spectacle all at the same time. Some of the later battles with the Zeta Gundam, the Cubile, the O, they all look great. Especially when the show starts going into the weird new type stuff, it takes cues from the original Gundam's trippy space psychedelics and adds even more to it. One thing that did get a little stale about the original Mobile Suit Gundam was how the different mech battles played out. Sure, the Gundam is cool, but the gun tank and gun cannon don't really get much love. A lot of the time it felt like Amuro did most of the work and it did feel stale at certain parts of the series. In Zeta, it's much more common to have two, three, or even four mobile suits per side during a battle. Engagements feel more dynamic, and this provides a lot more drama with last second saves, heavy losses, and of course more and more mobile suits. Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam follows a similar storyline to the original show. Although it incorporates events from Gundam 079 quite heavily, and many moments in Zeta have direct correlations to the show, you can watch it with no prior knowledge of Gundam. However, I don't completely recommend that. You'll miss a good amount of context and character moments. But if you really can't get over the art and animation of 79, Zeta might be your place to start.
Now, this isn't to say that there are no issues with Zeta. This show definitely is not perfect. Some of the issues present in the original Gundam also rear their ugly head here, specifically pacing. Every episode has to have a mecha fight, as it had been ordained by the Bandai overlords. New suits get introduced quicker than they blow up, and the Titans always seem to notice the Argama getting up to some mischief just in time to launch a counterattack. In fact, there's multiple times in Zeta where attacks and counterattacks are launched as distractions, because there's no other real reason to have a mobile suit battle. This all sort of adds up to the feeling that if a battle hasn't been foreshadowed for at least an episode, it's pretty much just to show off a new mobile suit that week. And look, it's really not such a big deal. I mean, my pupils dilate for some robot-on-robot -robot carnage every 10 minutes as well. I personally think the worst aspect of Zeta Gundam is the pacing of the overarching story. While it's easy to ignore the battles and new suits and just take in the spectacle, it's much harder to push away the feeling that our characters aren't really doing much. Pacing of the overarching plot has two modes. Go really fast and wait at a yellow light just so the people behind you can't go. In particular, there's a stretch of about eight episodes in the latter half of the series where I'm just not really sure what the Argama's goal is. They just kind of go place to place and fend off Titan attacks until the final arc of the show starts. It's kind of strange, but at least there's still good material in those episodes, so at least it's not too bad. Of course, this wouldn't be a sequel without some returning characters, huh? Probably most importantly, we have the return of the Red Comet himself, Shar Aznable. Making a terrible attempt to hide his former identity, he joins the Ayug as Quattro Bajin. And if you ever want to illustrate the difference between 70s and 80s anime art styles, just show a picture of Shar from each series side by side. I mean, look at my boy now. He grew his hair out, grabbed a swag as hell sleeveless vest, and he wears sunglasses inside. Yes, yeah, Shar is back in all his glory. Although he's a bit more mature in this show and he betrays less people, Shar's arc is an interesting one as he learns he can't just hide behind the cover of being a mere soldier. Shar has to put on that mantle of responsibility and become the leader the world needs. Whether or not he fulfills this arc by the end of Zeta is up for debate, but boy, it's an enjoyable journey for a likable but complicated character. Amaro also returns in much less of a capacity than you would probably think. He shows up for an arc in the middle of the series as a supporting character to Camille and Char. Turns out the government doesn't trust new types even though Amaro helped immensely during the One Year War. He spends 10 or so episodes getting his groove back and hopping back into a mobile suit, eventually helping Camille get off of Earth, and joining an Earth-based subsidiary of the AU. All in all, Amaro's segment of the show is pretty good. I don't mind him being just a supporting character. If anything, it makes the universe feel even bigger, with Amaro and the One Year War being only a small part of the Federation's history. The man himself, Bright Noah, also returns as a major character. He begins the show being a war hero who gets the shit kicked out of him just because the Titans are assholes. He then officially joins the Ayug and becomes captain of the Argama. Much like the white base from MSG, the Argama is a prototype mobile suit assault carrier. Personally, I think the Argama is even cooler than the white base. It just looks sick. Classic 80s sci-fi spaceship. It definitely feels appropriate to have Bright at the helm. Bright is also sort of funny in Zeta. The writers definitely leaned into the meme of Bright slapping people into shape. In MSG, we saw Bright's journey to be a confident and effective commander, and in Zeta, we see the culmination of that arc. Sure, old Bright doesn't go through much development in this installment, but that's okay. He's the straight man to Camille and Char. Overall, the returning characters showcase a good amount of growth and help the world building. It's interesting to see how legacy characters interact with a post-one-year war world. Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam offers viewers a look at a very interesting perspective that we don't often get to see in many forms of media. The conflict of Mobile Suit Gundam was mostly wrapped up by the end of that series. Zeon was defeated and Amuro made it back to his friends. So what happens after seven years? Sure, the immediate conflict was wrapped up, but the Earth is still polluted to the point that major geological disasters had taken place. 
Spacenoids still felt discriminated against by the Federation government. We get to see the aftermath, the breakdown of democracy, the rise in proliferation of fascism, and how there are people left willing to fight it. I started this video out by saying it was a dark and moody series. That's absolutely true. Zeta broods a lot. However, Zeta Gundam also shows what the light and the darkness can look like. Camille is a character that, much like Amuro before him, loses almost everything. Both his parents, a girlfriend, friends, Camille leaves many people behind during his journey, and we see that in his development. I suppose what I admire most about Zeta Gundam is its willingness to be a mature series despite its requirement of selling toys of multicolored robots. In the end, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam feels like a natural evolution of the original series. It's moody and dark while simultaneously being hopeful. The art is captivating at times and holds a classic style that's aged spectacularly well. The soundtrack is composed of a full complement of brass instruments lending to the feeling of Zeta being a grand and epic space opera. I watched this show specifically because I wanted to make a video about it, and I can say that at no point did it ever feel like work. Even the pacing in the midsection of Zeta had moments of character building and spectacular battles. And while I desperately want to spoil the ending for everyone right here, just, I won't. Just trust me, it's worth finding out for yourself. Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam is not only worth a watch, it's required viewing for any mecha or 80s action anime enthusiast. Thank you for watching. These last two Gundam videos have really awakened the creative juices inside me, and I'm incredibly excited to see what I can make and put here in 2022. See you next time. Hey everyone, welcome to the end card. I just wanted to thank you all again if you made it this far into the video. Uh, please comment down below and let me know what you thought. I'm going to throw a couple of videos up on the screen that you should check out. Probably the first Gundam video and also the Halo video, which I, I think was fun and really good. Um, I'm definitely excited to do more of this type of thing in uh, 2022. Uh, we're also going to do a bunch of gaming videos. In-depth gaming reviews and things like that in this in a similar vein to this So stick around for that uh, subscribe if you want to see more of that also I live stream on twitch sometimes So if you want to see that and be part of like the recording for the gaming Review videos then uh, go ahead and check out the link. I'll put it in the description down below again Thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate every single one of you Every single person that subscribes leaves a comment and what have you. And uh, hey, we'll see you next time. Thank you.